coming on my uh, hopefully one hour tour. Uh, we're going <laughs> to explore the, the Greenway, the, the Silver Bow Creek Greenway. So first let me acknowledge uh, quite a few people, geologists on the left and historians on the right. Um, and this is many, if not most, of the people who have contributed to my knowledge, whether by discussions and brainstorming or whatever else, or providing specific information. They are, of course, in no way responsible for the fantasies that I'm about to perpetrate on you. Um, and uh, the, the kinds of information that I'm going to try to share come from very diverse directions. Some of it is completely interpretive by, by me, based on things that other people think too. This is how geology works. It's not quite how history works, although sometimes we can't really figure out what was going on, as you undoubtedly know. So uh, we'll start by giving you an overview of where the trail is. The entire trail system goes from the Granite Mountain Memorial, up there where you know, down to Rocker, and back this way toward the visitor center, to Ramsey, and then ultimately it's going to come to the rest area uh, along Highway 1 uh, on the way to Anaconda. The part that I'm going to focus on is going to ignore the hill trail here that comes through Butte. I think most of you know that there's a lot of history there, and I couldn't possibly do that in one hour. Plus, I understand that the archives has some information about that area. Uh, <laughs> a little bit. So we're going to, oops, we are going to focus on the Silver Bow Creek Trail, which starts at the Whiskey Gulf Station, goes to Ramsey, and then will go all the way to that rest area. The uh, overview of the history, you know most of this, I think, so I've really just made an outline. The uh, 1860s and 70s were focused on the placer mining down in the creek itself, so we're going to have a lot of stuff about the placer mining history down there. The uh, 18, sorry, I keep putting the wrong one here. The 18, 80s and 90s really focused on the railroads that came through and, and connected Butte to the rest of the world. Um, and then in the 20th century and on, the main things that happened were Ramsey happened, the interstate happened, and the trail happened. There are plenty of other things. You know that I'm, I'm broad brushing it here. But this is the focus of the things that happened right along that little corridor uh, in which we are focusing. For geology, the history, the geologic history of Southwest Montana goes back 3.3 billion years at least. The good news for you is we're not going to talk about all of that. We're going to ignore 98% of it, in fact, because basically all the rocks that are out there along the Silver Bow Creek Greenway uh, are younger than 76 million years, or 76 million years. There are these three rock types. The boulder batholith, you're very familiar with that. It sits here. We're in the middle of it. It's up around Homestake and all over the place. Um, and then on top of that, younger than that, are the lowland creek volcanics. These rocks were extruded and intruded about 50 million years ago, and Big Butte is an evidence of that. It's younger than the boulder batholith granite. There's no mineralization to speak of in the lowland creek volcanics. So when the miners found those rocks, they knew they were in the wrong place. They needed to find the Butte granite to find the mineralization that they were, that they were after. And then, as soon as everything starts uplifting, what happens? It starts to erode. So the dumping of the sediment, eroding off of those older rocks, the granite and the volcanics, turns into sediment. And we're going to talk about some of that out there, too. So those rocks are about uh, as young as about 30 million years, plus or minus. You see the age ranges on there. But uh, be happy that we're not going to talk about the other 98%. <laughs> it would take a while. <laughs> Here's my cartoon, and you geologists accept that this is a cartoon. This is not supposed to be a perfect cross-section, but a general view of how those rocks that we just talked about are related to each other. Most of the underlying area that we're going to be crossing here is all the Butte granite. Granite, about 76 million years old. The green stuff there and the purple things that come up through it are the volcanic vents and the volcanic rocks that float out on or were erupted out on to the surface above that granite. Then, when you break those rocks and you have basins that get filled up with that eroding sediment that I talked about, that's when you get stuff like this. These are what I'm going to refer to as tertiary sediments. 
it's really complicated in some places, and we could have fights with some other geologists about the exact details of what those things are. We're not going to do that. We're going to call it all tertiary sediments. So those are basically the three rock types that we have to talk about. So that's that's really all there is, with one exception that we'll get to. <clears throat> all right, we'll start here on uh, the, the Whiskey Gulch segment of the trail. Here's the Whiskey Gulch station on Santa Claus Road. You, if you're all mostly, I guess, from Butte, so you know things like where Santa Claus Road is, it's really challenging to tell people that are not from Butte how to get to some of these stations. Yes. It's a little bit obscure. You know, try to imagine telling somebody how to get to Whiskey Gulf Station. Well, go out Excelsior until it doesn't go north-south anymore, and then take this intersection and do that, and watch for that road that you can't quite yeah. see. It's really hard to find but these don't things. take the other left. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and, if, and if Dory Speargrid, who's on the Greenway board, can get her funding, I hope that they'll make more signage for, for how to get to these places. That would be a useful thing. Um, so that's the part we're going to talk about first, will be this mile and a half that goes from Whiskey Gulch Station to, uh, to Rocker. <laughs> we will start with the geology, and the geology is pretty simple. Fundamentally, everything that out there is granite, except for Silver Bow Creek itself, which is, is modern uh, alluvium that's just laying down there. But Whiskey Gulch is almost certainly a fault zone. Uh, this shows on basically all the maps that have been produced for, for that area. And it goes just about right through the, the parking lot for the Whiskey Gulch uh, 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 station starting point for the trail. And Whiskey Gulch, as you know, out there beyond the mining museum, is quite a nice linear uh, depression, a, 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 an arroyo if you want, a river if you like, but it's got water flowing in it. But it is a fault zone that separates two different kinds of granite. The Butte granite is the stuff you're familiar with. The boulders of the boulder batholith, the big brown things, the crumbly stuff beyond the mining museum that's just decomposed granite. I'm sure you're familiar with that kind of stuff just from walking around. The stuff over here to the west, uh, toward Rocker, is called aplite. That's just a word that we use for fine-grained granite. It isn't really very different in composition. This is what the two of them look like. Here is the, the standard Butte granite. That's from a core in the Leonard Mine. And this is from the Bluebird Mill out near Rocker. You can see that the stuff is more fine-grained. And there may be a difference in terms of the number of black things, the number of dark things. But that's not even as big of a deal as the grain size. So that's about all it is. And here's a geologic map of the area. The green stuff on here is this aplite, and the pink stuff on here is the Butte granite, and there's the Whiskey Gulch Fall that goes through. So it's a fairly prominent fall. It's not, well, I'm, I was about to say it's not active in a modern sense, but I don't really know that. Um, but I'm not losing any sleep over it either. <laughs> So uh, historically, probably the coolest thing out there on that segment is the Bluebird Mill. And it's not on that segment. It's over on the hill trail, the gravel road, or the gravel trail that goes from Rocker up to the mining museum. And I've given a talk about that before. I think it's on YouTube if you're, if you're interested. But the best view is actually from the trail segment, the Whiskey Gulch Trail segment that we're talking about now. Because here's what it looks like from the Whiskey Gulch Trail today. This is what you would have seen in 1897, just about the same scale. So um, it's, it was a pretty impressive thing. It's kind of a blow your mind kind of thing to me. And, and, and if you're on the other trail, you can go up there and explore. And geologically, again, everything you're looking at is the granite or the aplite, that fine grain granite, one or the other. But there are uh, lots of places where you can find little crystals. If you want big ones, go over by Delmo and Homestake and whatever and dig and explore and work hard. But over here, if you want to find little ones, they're really pretty easy to find, little smoky quartz crystals like that. So they're kind of all over that hill where the Bluebird Mill used to be. Okay, let's get to Rocker. Rocker is more complicated and more interesting, and again, it's one of those places that it's hard to tell people what to do because the, the hill trail, uh, that comes down from the mining museum seems to end when you get to the iron bridge that goes across the, the main street of, of Rocker. Well, it kind of does end officially, but you can wend your way down through the weeds and, and on the streets to get down to the Rocker station. It's only maybe, I don't know, 
an eighth of a mile. It's not very far at all, and it's very easy to do, but you have to know that you can, as opposed to being shot by somebody whose private property you're crossing. So uh, just do that, because it's a good way to connect. The other trail, the one we're talking about, the Whiskey Gulch Trail, comes up to a point on the uh, west side of the Rocker Station and, and makes it join there. So Rocker itself has a long history. It started in the late 1860s uh, supporting the placer mining that was going on throughout the creek down there. Um, it evolved into a railroad junction and eventually it evolved into the timber treating place for the Anaconda Company. So most of the buildings that were associated, and, and these ones here are ones that are still standing uh, near the Rocker Station that are historic and were associated with either the, the train system, the depots, or with the, the timber treating system that was there. And the timber treating system also caused an environmental problem. The way you used to treat timber was with arsenic. So Butte has its own arsenic problems. Rocker had a bigger arsenic problem because of the, the treating of all the timbers that were coming into Butte to support the mine operation. Um, Where was the town pumped in uh, relation to that? Um, it is uh, uh, in, oh, right in here. In the corner oh, so of the room. <laughs> yeah. So, so the Rocker station is east of the town pump area? Yes. Yeah, not very far. If you come off the interstate, um, uh, actually, it's, I guess it's a little bit further. It's more like up here. The exit's going to be about up there. So you come off the exit, here's the town pump, and then take that road that says no truck turnaround. You come through Rocker and to the Whiskey Gold Station. Okay, this is a complicated map with lots of lines. I'll try to point out what they, what they represent. The first thing I want to point out is that essentially all of Silver Bow Creek, everywhere from up here to the end of it, down at Warm Springs, is reconstructed. It is not in the same place that it used to be. And this is the only map that I have that shows that. But uh, the, the light blue line right here, this is the reconstructed Silver Bow Creek, okay? And the dark blue line is where it used to be. So you can see that they have actually changed the positions of the railroad bridge. The main railroad bridge over the creek was way down here. Now it's over here. Uh, and it also uh, provides an overpass for the, for the trail. So the creek in many places where it's been reconstructed, maybe hundreds of yards from its original position, they, they, they basically rebuilt the entire floodplain from the ground up. That's what they had to do because it was so contaminated. Um, so, knowing that then, all these uh, open squares now are buildings that are gone. This was, I can't call it a roundhouse because it was rectangular, but it, was, it did things that roundhouses do. Trains would come into it and back up or you know, do things. <laughs> and the, the railroad also had this Y which was used for turning things around. So it came down this way onto the BANP, the Butte Anaconda and Pacific uh, Missoula Gulch Line, which we call the Hill Trail today, and joined onto the other uh, lines that went on back to, uh, to the west. So some of this is, is the other branch of the BANP, and that's still there, um, but some of them are the Milwaukee Road and the, and the uh, Northern Pacific and whatever, and I already told somebody, I'm not real good at railroad history. I can't keep track of them, so, so don't try to pin me down on that one too much. Um, so on the south side of the creek, were where the, the timber framing and, and arsenic treatment work was mostly happening, the south side of the old creek. It's the south side of the new creek, too. The depot, which was right there, was on the north side of the creek, so you didn't have to cross a bridge to get to it. And it was right here near this, uh, this train turnaround uh, uh, and, and maintenance operation. The, uh, the vacant lot that's right next to or just east of the Rocker Station today, the bike station, the parking lot, uh, was a historic hotel. That was the, the railroad hotel for, for Rocker that served uh, all this railroad system. So that's gone, but the ones in solid purple are still there. Uh, yes. All right, here's an old map from 1942 of that same area, and it's tilted a little bit, sorry. Um, so it's not quite the same orientation, but here's the timber framing mill. Let me back up. 
Oops, back up, not go forward. This building right here, this building complex is what we're about to see on the next slide, this one. So that's where we are, right there. And the old Silver Bow Creek was up there to the north of it. And here's the arsenic uh, uh, timber treating plant right there. So there are a lot of buildings there that are all completely gone now, or mostly gone. A few of them have survived. And geologically, probably the most interesting thing out there is the Rocker Fault. This is a large, important fault that has probably moved fairly recently, as recently as 1.8 million years ago. That's yesterday, geologically speaking, <laughs> according, to, uh, according to Colleen uh, Elliott and Katie McDonald in their mapping of the, the hazards of Silver Bow County. And there may be as much as 3,000 feet of displacement on this fault. And it goes almost down to Melrose, or maybe even a little bit beyond. It is the second largest fault in uh, Silver Bow County after the Continental Fault that you're probably familiar with over there that basically lifts up the East Ridge. So um, not a trivial thing at all. And its orientation, you can almost see it here, for example, in the topography. It gets a little less clear cut, and there might be branches of it as you come up this way. But this is about where it is, and we're going to focus now onto the trail area so you can see where it is when you're, when you're crossing. It goes pretty much right about where the Iron Bridge is at the end of the, the, the gravel trail that comes up to the mining museum. And when you're on the Whiskey Gulch Trail, just about where you're crossing the road, the street there, is about where it goes through. Mm -hmm. When you're out here in the floodplain, the fault is not evident really at all, So because that's all been re rebuilt and there's nothing remotely like accent, uh, uh, offset. But, uh, but that's about where it goes, and you can see the topography that's in here and the flatness that's out here. When you come down the hill from the interstate down into Rocker, you're crossing the Rocker Fault. Huh. So that topographic hill that goes down is the expression of that change. And when you get to Rocker then, you're out in the flat. It's flat for a good long way, basically all the way to Ramsey. So all that flat is that stuff that was in that one cross section that was dropped down and filled with tertiary sediments. So the flatness on the surface is a little bit of an evidence for that. There could be plenty of other reasons for explaining it, but it's not nice outcrop of, of rubbly, uh, bouldery granite or other kinds of rocks that are resistant. So, so that's that change that happens right there. So when you cross it, either on the, the Hill Trail or the Whiskey Gulch Trail, you know it. You know that it's there. And rocker, you know what a rocker is? Mm -hmm. Most of you probably do. A rocker is nothing but kind of a glorified sluice box that's on rockers, just like a rocking chair. And you shake it back and forth because you're looking for gold. You're trying to shake the gold, like in a gold pan, but, but more systematically and with less human arm effort <laughs> and more of a, a rocking chair effort. So uh, it's just a way of processing uh, gold in a, in a stream sediment try to find the, the gold. That's how Rocker got its name, for those kinds of implements that they were using throughout this, uh, this stretch of Silver Bow Creek. Okay, the next segment that we'll cross will be from the Rocker Station here to the interstate and where it goes under a railroad tunnel there. So that segment right there is our next portion that we'll talk about. That's about 2.2 miles is how far that is. And when you first leave Rocker Station, which is right here, the parking lot and the uh, restrooms and whatever, you cross Silver Bow Creek, the reconstructed Silver Bow Creek right here, and you pass the last of the historic buildings, which was the Creosote building, the, the Creosote and Arsenic building. And then the, the uh, trail and the creek both swing out around this nice oval grassy thing. And if you look at it, you see all these big pipes in there. Those are wellheads because what that little oval thing is, is the low level waste repository. That's where they took the arsenic laden stuff that wasn't too bad and put it there. They put it in a lined system and it's, I mean, all the environmental things that you do uh, to protect it and they monitor the hell out of it. That's what all those wells are about because you were asking before, there's the town pump and they have their own well. And no, we don't want leakage from this repository to get to that well. So they monitor it aggressively. 
I'm not sure. Do, do anybody know if the Bureau is who does that or if it's the DEQ? It doesn't matter. Somebody monitors it because I've been out there many times. I bet I've seen 10 times there's somebody out there doing stuff in it's those spells. It's EPA spells. contractor. What's that? EPA contractor. Okay, fine. Thank you, Joe. Um, somebody is looking. <laughs> That's a good thing uh, because you don't want even low-level arsenic waste to get into anything else. So we're trying to make sure that does not happen. The next segment, where we just were, would be just off to the right. And the trail, I'm sorry I keep changing colors on you, but the trail now is in red here. And here's the end of the segment we're about to talk about. Here's Nistler Road that comes from Rocker, which is off to the right there. And if you can tear yourself away from turning off to go to uh, Sagebrush Sands, <laughs> you, can, uh, <laughs> you, you will see within this yellow circle here uh, an area of, of granite. It's uh, an area of big, rubbly granite boulders. And it's enigmatic. It's unexpected because we're out there in the middle of, remember, this, this flat tertiary sediment. It's got some topography, yes, but fundamentally it's flat. So here's this pile of granite out there, and it is not trivial granite. It's big pieces, this big. Some of them are even bigger than that. That's Mike sticking you for scale there, by the way. And the, 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 the Bureau, with their admirable geologists, and I don't mean to put them down at all, I mean to admire them greatly, have interpreted this in at least three different ways. Uh, one shows that yellow piece right there. Elliot and McDonald called it part of a debris flow. That just means a lot of material, even big material, being carried one way or the other, landslides, water flow, I guess those are the choices pretty much, um, out to, to this spot. That would be quite recently, like in the last two million years or so. Scarberry and others from the Bureau map it as simply part of this, uh, whatever color that is, yellowish color, as part of the tertiary sediments. Well, how to get there, we could talk about that. And uh, 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 Dick Berg and Phyllis Hargrave interpret it as this little gray thing, same as this. KBQM means butte quartz monzonite, which today we call the butte granite. So they're just saying that it's an outcrop of the actual granitic rock. It's eroded and it's the boulders. It's the boulders of the boulder batholith that are kind of just left behind. And I think that Phyllis would say that if it is, if you went down a depth, you would find a good solid, at least based on this map here. She may have changed her mind. <laughs> um, what, what do you want to say, Phyllis? I want to say that it is a landslide. And it was a, initially a map by Dick Berg at Athlete. Uh, dikes coming through there. When I map the area later than this, I have a picture of myself riding that rock, and it is a big ass landslide. And I don't know the topography when it happened, but it had to be steel. Anyways, go ahead. So there you have it. So 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 Phyllis, now you you would be more in line with with Colleen and, and Katie's map. Yeah, they took ours. <laughs> okay, well fine. The point of all this for you all is that geologists do change their minds because this is, I mean, it is enigmatic, frankly. When me and Mike were out there, and I had not talked to you or read about it or anything, I was like, what's going on here? Why is this stuff here? Because how do you get a big thing like that? How do you transport it? And what Phyllis just said, a landslide is a very reasonable way to do that. Where did that landslide from? Because there's no mountains that are very close. No hills even very close. It's about the highest spot out there, in fact. So there are a lot of problems just from this really subtle little pile of granite boulders. Aliens. Well, aliens, yeah, there's one interpretation. <laughs> Um, but that's, that's uh, apart from sagebrush sands, that's the most interesting thing out there in the, in the middle of the, the trail system. So we, we, we were just talking about these rocks right here. We're now going to cross the railroad, cross the creek, and proceed on to the west. As we do that, as soon as you cross the creek, you're in an area or near an area that was called McMinnville. So historically, McMinnville was essentially a, a tent town. It only lasted for about two years, but in that two years, they produced or they found nearly $80,000 worth of gold. 
1867 to 1869. And McMinnville was there. It was along one of the ditches that brought water all the way from uh, the Atlantic drainage down by Divide down here to Butte so they could use it for plaster operations. Water to fill up the, the rockers and whatever above the creek. Don't ask me why it was easier to build a 50 mile ditch than it was to just haul some water uphill for 200 yards, but that's how they did things back then. And if you look carefully on Google Earth, you can, you can find up here in the hills, which sometimes are still called the McMinnville Hills, you can see traces of those, uh, those, those ditches, those water ditches. They're not continuous by any means, but if you know where to look and look hard, you can find them. Nothing left in McMinnville. I'm not sure there was a solid building there. It's referred to as, as tents and shacks. Um, and it was completely gone, completely gone by 1870. But everything they were doing in that time frame uh, left its mark. And when you get here to the western part of this segment, you can see here on Google there, there's a, a texture there to the topography. And when you're on the land, on the ground down there, you, you see hummocks, piles and piles and piles of rocks, big rocks like this. And for whatever reason, and I'm not a biologist, but you can also see that there's a lot more trees in there. There's junipers and the very occasional Douglas fir, big trees. They seem to like that kind of material. What that is, is the dumps from the placer operation. This is stuff that's from the 1860s, because pretty much all this was done about 1870. Sure, there was a little bit of rejuvenation over time at various times and after that, but fundamentally, this is 1864 to 1870 in terms of the, the, the manhandling of all these rocks looking for gold out of Silver Bow Creek. The, the, the placers used to expand, extend basically from somewhere here west of, the, of what we call Nistler Junction now all the way back to Rocker. And uh, over the entire history of that stretch, it produced almost $250,000 uh, uh, worth of gold. $250,000 is about six or seven million dollars today. So it was pretty rich. It's nothing like Alder or Virginia City or even Bannock. But for Butte, it was probably the primary place where the, the placer gold came from. <clears throat> On the map, uh, there's a star right here at the end of the, of the placer zone. And just remember that, because we're going to get to it in momentarily. So this is what it looks like. They look like a bunch of big graves or something covered with stones, <laughs> but they're just pile after pile after pile. And these are the placer dumps. This is where hundreds, hundreds and thousands of guys out there just dumping stuff, stuff that they had already gone through. We looked at this, this rocker full of stuff, dump them, we're done. So it's all there. And that's just a cartoon that shows something about how plasters work. Now that star that you get to almost, you're almost to the interstate, you're near the, the last bench before you get to the interstate, mm -hmm. there's some big rocks there, big rocks sitting on the side of the trail, and at a glance you think that they were big rocks of granite. And let me say too, at this point, almost all of the big rocks that you see near the trail and around the parking lot and so on out there, um, they're, they've been put there. They're not in place, they're not in their original location, they're put there as landscaping rocks, basically. Mm -hmm. but. I'm convinced completely that they are close, close enough to their original location to tell us information about the geology. So you find big blocks of granite where there's granite below, and you find this rock, which is not granite, where this rock is below. You remember the tertiary sediments, those things that were dropped down, the basin formed by the rocker fault and filled in with the eroded stuff? When you go over and look at this stuff, you see that it's layered. It's not, like granite is not layered. Mm -hmm. Looks like granite, but it's got layers in it, and it has a chunk of other rock in it there. That chunk of rock right there is a piece of the volcanic rocks. That tells us that this rock was eroded and deposited later than most of granite, which composes most of the stuff, and the volcanics, which makes this one, it's not just one, there's a fair number of them, that's just a nice big one that I found. So it's after 49 million years ago. That's when this rock was formed, when it was deposited and solidified and uh, buried somewhere, and then they dug it up and put it here to make it look cool. Um, the, the brown lines that go through it are just iron oxide, 
Those are not really the layers of the rock. Those are, are positions where the water percolating through the rock would have precipitated iron oxide at various stages of, of standstill. The, the, darker, the darker bands would be the water was there and evaporating for a longer time, so it deposited the stuff that was precipitating out. Um, and the other parts were where it was sort of flowing through and picking up the iron to deposit it in those layers. So um, that's the first time you, going west that you get to see a really good example of these tertiary sediments. So we will now continue to what to me in the whole stretch is probably the most interesting both historically and geologically. The intersection of the, the interstate today Nistler Road, two railroads, the trail, and Silver Bow Creek. That's where Silver Bow City was. <coughs> Silver Bow City is where the prospectors first found the gold. The gold monument for that is here on Nistler Road. So like somewhere about in there is where we think that the first guys found the, the, the good pay gold. And the, one of the prospectors, Pete McMahon, claimed that he was making like $1.65 a day, or no, $1.65 per pan. That's a whole lot of money in 1864. That's a whole lot of money. So that stimulated the development of Silver Bow City, which was right here. There's not much left that we can see, but there are things that we can figure out. So we will look first at the history. These are two old maps that just show you generally that, that we knew about them. Butte is right there, and Silver Bow is those four dots right there. This map that I got from Mary McCormick is maybe a little bit better, shows rockers, this is 1877. So this is actually well after the, the, the primary plaster operation. And Silver Bow City was still there too. The interesting thing to me about this map mostly is that there's an implied bridge across Silver Bow Creek right there. Just keep that in mind because we'll talk about it in a momentarily. But um, the places existed, they were known, and Silver Bow City, for its early life, was way, way more populous than Butte. There were times when some people estimate that um, Silver Bow City had 2,500 people. That's probably a little bit high, a little bit of exaggeration there, but maybe not too much. At a time when Butte, on a good day, had 400 people. So Silver Bow City was a big deal. Silver Bow City, uh, in fact, was the first county seat of Deer Lodge County. Montana had just been separated from Idaho a territory in, I think, May of 1864. In June and July of 1864, the prospectors were out there finding the gold in Silver Bow Creek. Silver Bow City began and was named the first county seat of, uh, Silver, of, of uh, Deer Lodge County. Silver Bow was part of Deer Lodge County until 1881. Okay, so here's what's left. Here's a modern, a modern image. The malt house there, uh, which is a private house now, it's no longer a brewery. I know you all know that, but apparently Guy Graham, who owns the house, has had people coming up and say, is this a brewery? <laughs> Google Earth tells them that it's a brewery, but it's not, um, and you know that. Here's the bridge I was talking about. Well, not the bridge, a bridge that's probably in the same position. Um, this bridge was probably built about 1918. There's newspaper reports that imply there was a wooden bridge that had been taken out by a flood and they had to spend all this money so that the council had to approve and all these kind of things. And on the trail system now, here's the trail and it goes under the railroad right there. So if you're familiar with the trail, this is that railroad tunnel. And there's the interstate, of course. The other thing that's on here that is actually historic is Nistler Road, at least until there. That, which is now a driveway for, for the, these newer houses, that's where Nistler Road used to go. They moved Nistler Road down here when they put the interstate through so they would only have to build one overpass. Mm -hmm. One overpass for the railroads, the creek, the trail, and Nistler Road. Nistler Road used to curve kind of up that way. Silver Bow Creek used to curve up that way. If you're out there at what we call Nistler Junction now, um, and you're on Nistler Road, all that wetland that's over there, that's really Silver Bow Creek. It used to be anyway. Um, and now it's been channelized and you know fixed and cleaned and all those things that we're happy about. So uh, this is the way it looks today. This is the way it looked in 1891. This is the Sandborn map. 1891 is much later than uh, the, the uh, primary time, but the buildings and so on at Silver Bow City had not gone away yet. 
the perhaps interesting thing about this is that here's the malt house up there. The brewery was mainly down here close to the creek. I don't know why they put the big malt house up there and the main brewery was down here, but there it was. The road that's here is quite prominent. This shows up repeatedly on, on multiple Sanborn maps. But what I did was, knowing the malt house and knowing this bridge and knowing Silver Bow Creek and knowing the county road, I overlaid them. And this is the result of that. Mm -hmm. So there's the malt house. There's the bridge on both the map and the image. Here's the county road that used to go through there. And here where all those buildings were. So when you're out there in front of the, the malt house, in front of Kai Graham's house, you need to visualize a lot of buildings around there that are completely gone now. And that's only on this side. I'm sure there were other buildings over here on this side, as there are today, further along as you go back toward Rocker. There are other places there, at this place we call Nistler Junction. It gets confusing because we think of this as Nistler Junction, and we think of Silverbow as a place we haven't gotten to yet, but this was Silverbow City. Silverbow City and Silverbow Junction are different, different kettles of fish. And there's the, the malt house taken in uh, 1982. Chris Nissler, who, who established the brewery, had first been a, a brewer up in German Gulch. That didn't work out because, you know, these places are fly-by-night places. So he was here in Silver Bow City with, with a brewery as early as 1871. But his success didn't develop until the late 1880s. And uh, it's like it says there, 4,000 barrels a day. No, that isn't right. It was 4,000 barrels a year. That's not, not a day, 4,000 barrels a year, sorry. <laughs> and, and then the next year he built, he built this, and they established uh, an outlet up in Butte too, because Butte was the place to be by, by the 1880s. Uh, Chris Nissler died in, in 1901. The place was sold, it became the Capitol Brewery and the Crystal Springs Brewery, and was completely out of business by 1912. And if it hadn't been, it would have totally been out of business by 1919 when Prohibition took over. But uh, uh, the Malt House is uh, it's an independently listed entity, I believe, of the uh, National Historic Landmark District, one of only about 15 or so in, in Silver Bowl County. All right. From just a little bit west of, of uh, the Malt House uh, on, on Nistler Road, is the, the monument to the discovery of, of gold in um, uh, 1864, July of 1864. In 1906, uh, an article in the paper showed a picture of Sherman Butte. This was describing the origins of the name Silverbow, Silverbow Creek. I think you can believe me now when, when I say that that feature there is really the same as that feature there. Mm -hmm. For a while when I got started on all this, I wasn't really positive where Sherman Butte was because it's not named on any modern maps, but that's Sherman Butte. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I am completely convinced that it's Sherman Butte. It's on the other side of the creek from, from, the, from the gold monument here. And it was on Sherman Butte sometime in that July of 1864 that someone, most people say Pete McMahon, some people call him Pete Slater, some people say it was somebody else, was looking east into the, the sunrise, or maybe west into the sunset, <laughs> but, but saw somewhere a nice beautiful curve with the sunlight glinting off of it and compared it to a silver bow, and the rest was history. So um, this is where it happened. There's not really any doubt about that. The details are, are debatable, but uh, it happened here on Sherman Butte. I'm not even sure that it was named Sherman Butte because the, the only good reference is a, a, a reminiscence uh, by uh, Charles Warren, uh, an early major pioneer here in Butte, and it was he who said that he named Sherman Butte, and probably not in 1864, but it's sometime after that. So. Pretty sure it's, I'm positive actually that it's Sherman Butte. I'm positive that this is where those descriptions of Silver Bow came from, but other details, uh, do what you want. Dick, is that from a queer spot? What? Is the. Yes, it's a queer is, spot. Is that a queer spot? Yes, okay. queer spot is a Silver Bow Creek. Okay. Could you go back two previous screens? I've got a question, but one more. Down in the lower left corner, do you see that straight cut? Yes. Right there. Yes. yes. You see several of those as you're going down the interstate. Do you know what those are about? Yes. We're going to get to that. Okay. Okay. 
board members. Okay, so we have done the history over here of Silver Bow City. We're going to continue on the trail up this hill. And when you're old like me and you're riding your bike for the first time and you're out of shape, it feels like it's a lot more than 70 feet of, of gain. But that's all it is, actually. <laughs> so uh, uh, you're coming up on Sherman Butte, that fuchsia that we just saw in those pictures. And we're on the, the, the south, sorry, the south side of it here. The high point is up here. And uh, so we're going to switch into geology now. And this is a map that shows, here's the railroad tunnel, here's the malt house, there's the gold monument, here's Silver Bow Creek, and here's the trail. And those dots in the outcrops up there are the places where I established stations for making a geologic map, a rather detailed geologic map, to the extent that I could. And in exploring that country, uh, there's a lot to, to be seen, and I'm going to go through the pictures of it pretty quickly. But the way it happened was, again, I was tired and not able to go up the top of that hill without stopping. I stopped to catch my breath. There at my feet was a rock. Well, I'm a geologist. Geologists look at rocks. It was sparkly. We really look at sparkly. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I picked it up, and I thought, oh, this is probably quartz or something like that. Well, it turned out to not be quartz. It is the mineral fluorite. These crystals right here are the mineral fluorite, calcium fluoride. It's not that rare of a mineral, but it's a pretty mineral. And it was a little bit unexpected out there. So looking around, it's like, geez, there's fluoride everywhere. What's going on here? I didn't know. You know, but you know, you get curious and you pay attention. There's more than crystals like this. There are, are areas like this where it's kind of bubbly and, and rubbly and places where it almost looks like flowstone in a cave. And it's all fluoride. It's uh, it's just kind of boggling and puzzling, or at least it well it still is, but Sometimes you get nice cubes. This is sort of the standard appearance for fluorite, these yellow cubes over here. The yellow is a little bit unusual. And in this big rock here, that rock's about this big. And yes, I didn't haul it out. I had a friend helping me. Um, mm -hmm. But everything in there is actually fluorite. I, I, I've won a beer on this, uh, this layered stuff up here <laughs> saying that I thought it was fluorite. And it is fluoride, but Christy Ammons analyzed it, and that's what it is. That's really <laughs> unusual. It's like sediment, sedimentary fluoride that's got layers and that are probably colored by different amounts of iron. There's a lot of iron out there. And this other stuff down here is all fluoride. Fluoride, 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 everywhere. Lots of it. Here's a, uh, another mineral that's out there. The only other crystallized mineral like this is barite which is also not an especially uncommon mineral, but again, why? You know, that's the real question. Why do we have all this barite and fluoride? A lot of rocks like this, this is granite with a, a, a dike or a, a, a seam, a vein of, of fine-grained quartz, silica. The, the word for it is chalcedony. And they're just pretty things, you know. Again, I'll pick up a pretty thing whether I know anything about it or not, just because it's pretty. That's good enough, but you still want to figure stuff out. This is what the whole rock looks like. Breccia is the word for it. Breccia is from an Italian word that means broken. That's really all it means. And you can see how you would name a, a rock like this breccia. It's broken. And you might think that this rock here is all rubbly. You can come up here and pick it apart with your hand. It is the hardest rock you can imagine. It is cemented. Those pieces, those broken pieces, are cemented together like you can't imagine. Same thing over there. So something broke this rock apart and then cemented it back together. Here's another one. And in this case, all those pieces, and some of them are pretty big, all the white stuff in between is all fluoride. This rock is cemented together by fluoride. I'm totally scratching my head when I'm seeing these things, so we'll see what we can do. And on the, the hill of Sherman Butte, there are some places where this reddish stuff that we're going to call jasper, technically it probably isn't quite, but it's iron-rich quartz rock, silica rock. And below it here, there isn't any doubt in my mind that this and this down here are actually granite. 
but they're really weathered, they're really altered, they're really changed, as if they've been heated up by hot water and steam and, and other kinds of stuff going on. So there's a place out there, a few places out there, where you can actually draw this contact between those two rock types, and it seems like the one is on top of the other one, and maybe it baked the rock below, maybe it altered the rock below, maybe it brought in other chemicals and things to the rock below. We'll see if we can figure that out. And this is on Mista Road, looking back to the east. There is a contact between this stuff, this silica-rich stuff, which I'm pretty sure here is the volcanics, but with a lot of fluoride in it, and totally normal boulder basilisk granite over there. There isn't much doubt at all that there's a fault in between them somewhere. And what we're looking at here, we're going to go over there and look back this way toward the interstate for the next picture, right here, where we just were is, is I was standing right, right here looking that way. So that's that same fault, and that's the interstate right there. White rock here, red rock here. You can see where that fault goes on the interstate just because of the change in, in color. <laughs> and now, your question about the trenches, that's what you were talking about. Here's one here, here's another one here. They're all over uh, uh, Sherman View, lots of them. And, it has been said, and I didn't believe it even to start with, that these were places where they did hydraulic op operations, took a lot of water up and, and wash things out to, to do for plaster mining. Not true. They're, they're way too young, for one thing. These are all later than 1946, because there is a good USGS map of the area in 1946, and none of them are there. They would be there. And then Phyllis again, thank you Phyllis, has told me that she has talked to Tom Helahan, who had the claims out there, yeah. and he was looking for gold. And he got the highway department when they were building the interstate to dig these trenches for him. <laughs> I'd like to be a fly on that wall. <laughs> and no, he didn't find any gold, but he sure turned up a lot of fluoride. <laughs> and, and it makes it a lot easier for some random person like me to try to figure things out by, uh, by going out there. And there's even this old uh, building. It's on the oops, sorry. It's on the north end of the uh, the, uh, the butte. That's where that little mine and a, and a shaft is. Though that also must be later. It looks really old, but it's got to be later than 1946 because the U.S. Geological Survey mappers, I think, would have mapped it because they were mapping all these things. And here on Sherman Butte, these are the trenches here, there, there, the holes where things have been dug. And those are the places where you can tell what's above and what's below. Otherwise, it's pretty confusing. So what does it all mean? Well, this is what I think. And other geologists may want to argue. I think it was a Yellowstone-like situation where you had hot water, hot water that had fluorine and barium in it. That's a whole other story, I don't know why. But it had all this mineralization in it, hot water exploding, breaking the rock, making the breccia, and depositing the fluoride and the silica and the whatever. Um, to me, this is the best scenario for it. And there are faults around there that, that make it reasonable places for conduits for where the material could have come up. If so, it's, as far as we know, the only place like that in our immediate area. Uh, that's okay, I guess. Uh, <laughs> um, but that's my personal interpretation, and the, you know, the times that I've said that to other reasonably smart geologists, no one has said, no, it's impossible. Uh, if, if any of you want to say it's impossible, see me after. <laughs> okay, moving on a little bit further west now from Sherman Butte. We're going to come down the creek here, or down the trail here, and there is a spring right there. And what I want to show you is on the Google Earth, here's Sherman Butte. Look how reddish all this soil is in here. And look how white it is down here. And also reddish right in there and white over here. I think there's a fault zone that goes right through there that separates that reddish stuff, which is that fluoride and iron and all that stuff, from other rocks, which I think are just the standard tertiary sedimentary rocks. And that interpretation would be like this. The fact that there's a spring right there is just extra added attraction. Um, you can have springs in places without falls, but you know, you break the rock. That's a good place for water to come percolating up, so it's, it helps. Um, so that's an interpretation. This, sorry. 
This fault over here is the one that's really quite straightforward and everybody has mapped that fault. This one is mine <laughs> um, and doesn't show up on any other maps, but, um, and I'm not, I don't care if it's there or not. <laughs> so, but here's what it looks like on the ground. Here's that red soil. It is very, very red. Yeah. And just a few feet the other way, I don't have a picture of both of them, but here's the trail back there, and there's my bike, and there's the bench there. The rocks are, are, are snow white. And these are some of those tertiary sedimentary rocks. So I think that this is a boundary between the tertiary sedimentary rocks and the younger stuff that was deposited by a hot spring at uh, Sherman Butte. And here are some maps. This is again from Elliot and McDonald. They have a lot of faults going that way. I have no argument with those at all. These are the faults that come this way that everybody maps. There's my fault right there. So it's not that much of a stretch. I don't think anyway. <laughs> all right, finally we get to Silverbow Station. The story out here is mostly about railroads and uh, I'm not going to try to do that in any kind of detail. Here's a picture of the original Silverbow Station uh, building. I think essentially all of these buildings are gone now. And the last segment before Ramsey, uh, you have to go from Silverbow Station, which is another one that's hard to tell people how to get to, but you go on Silverbow Road for not very far, I don't think it's even a quarter mile, to where the Ramsey segment, another mile and a half segment, begins and goes over to Ramsey. Mm -hmm. All right, three things that we're gonna talk about here. The first uh, one is, if you remember, I pointed this out before. This is the reddish stuff, which is placers. This is the whitish stuff, where I think that fault goes between the two. I've labeled that one a debris flow. That's kind of what it looks like, but that's another place that's subject to multiple kinds of interpretation. It might be tertiary sediments. It might be a debris flow, a pile that has come down out of Brown's Gulch and has just been deposited there. It could, I suppose, be a landslide that's been carved, the side of it been carved by Silverbow Creek, that sort of thing. So not much to say except that uh, in the placers here, it's not just granite rocks like there were in the other ones because we have all that stuff upstream, the fluorite and the barite and other things that are also eroding down into the creek. And the one thing that's there that's cool, I think, is calcite. This is what it looks like in normal light and it is very fluorescent. And even though fluorite is the mineral that gives its name to the, the a property called fluorescence, hardly any of the fluorite out there is fluorescent. But the calcite is beautifully red fluorescent. And the other thing in that debris flow, you can find sapphires. Now, they're obviously not little gems exactly, but they are corundum, that's aluminum oxide. And uh, if it has any tint at all, we would call it uh, 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 sapphire, unless it's red, then you call it a ruby, uh, and they're there. Don't break your back looking for them, but if you spend some time, you might find one. Okay, then last on that trail, um, there are some places, again, with juniper trees and, and Douglas firs where there are placers, but here almost to the end, there are a couple more big rocks, and uh, this is what they look like. I'm sure they've been put there, but I'm also sure that they're from the immediate area. And they look like granite from a distance. Compositionally, they basically are granite, but it's granite debris. It's the decomposed granite, like you see out beyond the mining museum, solidified. And it's solidified in, in, a, in a water situation that makes these current uh, uh, things down here and different grain sizes and things like that. So I'm completely convinced that that's what that is out there. For history, Ramsey. Ramsey was built in 1916-1917 as the company town for DuPont's uh, explosive plant. This, uh, this, the plant here, this is how it was on the north side of the interstate. There's Ramsey right there. No trees. Um, and this was the contractor's camp. So the interstate is over here somewhere. So that's Ramsey. This was the plant. It's up on the Ulins land now. And you can see scars of it easily on Google Earth, but there's nothing there except for the water tower. I'm not sure if that water tower is the one that went with this or not. OK, it took us that long to go 6.3 miles. <laughs> and to finish the trail, we'd have to go 9.4 more miles to, uh, uh, to get from, from Ramsey to Crackerville. And then there's still more after that. 
I'm not going to do that. You'll be happy that uh, I'm not going to talk for the next three hours. Um, but we'll give you some teasers about, about the trail out there. If you have not been out to Fairmount Road and the, the new Gregson Station, which opened just last fall, I very, very much want to encourage you to do so. It's beautiful. I mean, I have no pro I love the rest of the trail, too. This, they have done a very, very good job, in my opinion, out there. Um, and this is what it looks like. Wow. There's trees. <laughs> trees are nice. I, I like trees. Um, and the, there is a, 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 right there, there is what amounts to a dam. They call it a fish barrier. It's to keep invasive species that are downstream from getting into the upper part of Silverboro Creek. And it's pretty. And then it's made this kind of wide, lakey like place. There's birds and deer and all manner of things out there. It's really pretty. And volcanoes. What's that? And the volcanoes. In the volcanoes, right? We're getting there. <laughs> um, so ge geologically, I think geologically is what we're doing first. Oh, no, historically, <laughs> a, a half a mile beyond the end of the paved trail is Durant. That was a, a station that uh, intersected the BA&P Railroad and the Milwaukee Road and whatever other railroad was going through there. It was a place where you could change from one to the other. And it was built in the early 1890s. The station of Durant is at the Mining Museum today. Um, and the remaining buildings, including this one, it's all on private property. Um, so don't go tearing things down. But uh, uh, this is just a half a mile beyond the end of the present paved trail, which is only, a, I think, 1.2 miles from the Gregson Station to the end of the pavement. Geologically, here's where we started at the Gregson Station. There's Fairmont. Here's the interstate. So this is the road you take. Um, and here's Silver Bow Creek going through Durant Canyon. This is the future trail, this is the existing trail, and all of this stuff in here is the Lowland Creek Volcanics. That green stuff that was on top of the, the, the boulder bath that in that early slide overview of the geology. The different colors are different aspects of it, different times, different rock types. The one thing that I'm going to point out are these four triangles. And these are mapped by Caleb Scarberry and whoever he was working with as inactive volcanic vents. So this zone that goes uh, northeast through here was a center of volcanism 50 or 53 million years ago. So uh, those rocks are pretty interesting, um, well, to me anyway. And <laughs> um, among other things, you can see uh, bits of the, the, the purplish stuff in there is the, the rock. It's like an, a volcanic ash fall that's solidified. But then later, the white stuff came in, and it's just silica, chalcedony, fine grain quartz, and it's usually fluorescent like that. You can find nice spires carved into this rock. This is near the, uh, the mouth of German Gulch along the trail. And even the riprap that they use for, for building up around the bridges and so on, abutments, is pretty interesting. This is, sorry, this is uh, from uh, the riprap there at the, the fish barrier. Crystals of, of calcite in a, in a cavity in, in a limestone rock. And it's just in the stuff they hauled in to build up the, the edge of the dam. This is the volcanic stuff again. It's very fine grained. And again, I think this is an ash fall, volcanic ash, like Mount St. Helens, but a lot of it that fell down and turned into rock. And you can see those little flow patterns in it, or those folded patterns. This rock has not been squeezed. This rock probably did that when it was warm. It hadn't cooled completely yet. So we would call this flow folding. Think of a, think of thicker than molasses and a lot hotter, <laughs> um, and, and it's flowing out on the surface. It's going to catch up on pieces of itself and, and make those kind of folds. There's a lot of that out there, too. And in the future, this is what you can expect to find. This is uh, through, or almost through Durant Canyon. This is the, the, the BA&P railroad crossing on the Milwaukee Road, which is, I think this is the Milwaukee Road. This is where um, the trail will go through. And these are some of the volcanic rocks, again, that have been carved into these great big hoodoos, or whatever you want to call them, spires. Call them what you like. Okay. And with that, I will say thank you. And, uh,